Lake Sacagawea is huge. It's the third largest man-made lake in the United States and its waters are in places over 200 feet deep. I drove more than 200 miles when I circled it. Access to it is, for its size and popularity, rather limited. Much of its western shore lies within the first Fort Berthold Indian Reservation and cliffs and canyons that border the lake deter tourists and vehicles. That's good. If it were more accessible, I'm sure it would be more exploited, more developed, and uglier. In contrast, the North Shore, bordered by North Dakota 23, has been taken over by the oil and gas industry. As the highway rises over coolies and falls again, curves around small blue ponds. This area is as far south as the glaciers extended. As I try to look at geese and ducks on the blue water and follow the flight of eagles, I've got tanker trucks, oil crew vans, and pump rigs on my bumper. These guys are not out here sightseeing. The wind is blowing hard across the highway and I've got my hands at 10 and 2, trying to hold on for dear life, trying to keep my RAV4 from rolling into a blue pond. Every few miles I'm assaulted by the oil or gas complexes, a few khaki green tanks, pumps that look a little like dinosaurs, an ugly bulldozed or bobcatted muddy parking lots, sometimes a crappy work trailer too. These compounds, far too many of them, remind me of scenes from third world movie sets, something that's supposed to be Afghanistan or Chechnya, where a military compound has been hastily set up and some black ops bunch of heavily armed men are going to blow it up. These things look like they were built last week and are only supposed to last for a few months. Like all booms, this one will end. But when it does, these compounds, their scavenged remains, the scars on the land they've trashed, will still be here. Each time I come around a curve or over a rise, I'm stunned and saddened by the next compound looming. All of them seem abandoned already. I never saw any workers. They were probably all on, my, on the highway, roaring up my ass and passing me at 70 miles an hour on a two-lane highway in a 30-mile wind gust. After my 40-mile sojourn in the oil-fracked wilderness, I came to Newtown. It's really a new town. It replaced towns that had been destroyed when the garrison dam inundated the land. Some folks wanted to name the town Vanish. It would have been a portmanteau made from the names of two destroyed villages, Van Hook and Sanish. Whoever made the decision to go with Newtown must have been frightened by irony. Newtown was scary, a post-apocalyptic scene from Mad Max. Beat up cars and old pickups and oil company trucks lined the store and social services parking lots and crowded three or four deep in a parking chaos I had never witnessed before. It was like thousands of poor people were trying to leave a shitty music festival at the same time and no one was moving. Hundreds of women and children, some Latinos, some Indians in flannel, milled and huddled among the stranded cars. Everyone wanted something, but I didn't know what it was. The highway was jammed too, bumper to bumper as far ahead and behind me as I could see. There couldn't be more than a few hundred people who lived out here, and all of them and more were desperately waiting in Newtown's few parking lots. Tankers, flatbed trailers, and other big rigs lumbered into town and out, throwing clouds of dust into the air. Oil workers, pickups jammed the highway too. Trapped in these squadrons of trucks were campers and RVs. Maybe some of them were tourists trying to make it into western North Dakota or Montana. Maybe some of them were oil field workers heading back to Williston and points west. At least one of the cars carried a simple-minded tourist, me, who was sickened by what he was seeing and was desperately trying to get the hell out of Newtown.